to have on my good friend and colleague from the Yes Network, Buck Showalter. He joins us now. Buck, it's Michael, Don, and Peter. And first off, how are you and your family holding up during these times? Good, Mike. I mean, all things considered, we're uh, we're doing good. The uh, you know, thank goodness I'm married to somebody I like as well as love because. Uh, Really, I've been in quarantine for 37 years, so this isn't a whole lot new for me. <laughs> well said. Now, okay. hey, let's start I mean, with I mean, Syndergaard. I mean, okay. Let, let's start with Syndergaard, Buck. Do you believe that a guy could throw as hard as Syndergaard from the first inning to the ninth inning and not ever have this happen? Because we saw Severino, who we used to marvel at the fact he was clocking 98 in the eighth inning, and then he has to have Tommy John surgery. Is it just a function of the job, or can you throw too hard? Well, it's a function of the human body, Mike. You know, the good Lord didn't turn, continue to put your hand over your head and jerk it down violently 100 times every fifth day. Okay, that's why we walk around with arms down by our sides and softball pitchers don't have, have the injuries very often pitching. You know, the only guy I had, I had to throw out the book on Randy Johnson. He was just a, a freak of nature from that. He was just warming up at 90 pitches. I finally figured it out. But every other pitcher I've had, you know, was, I think it's a byproduct of, today's system chasing velocity and chasing spin rates and chasing, you know, these guys got cameras on the first day of camp. I mean, they're competitive. They're going to start torquing some pitches. And, you know, it's just a matter of time. When you when you give somebody five years, you sign up in blood to get three years. Because by the time that you warranted that type of track record to get that contract, you've got X amount of wear and tear on your elbow and shoulder. So, it, it's you know, you're going to go through it. I mean, does anybody want to take a bet on how long any pitcher that signs over three years is going to, what kind of return you're going to get? Someone made a good point one time. I think it was Leland said it's a real good baseball decision. It's a bad business decision, long-term contracts on, t- on pitchers. But, you know, I think it's a byproduct of you look at the relief pitchers and you know, these guys are, are over torquing pitches the first day of camp and these pitching coaches are fighting like heck to get some of these cameras off these guys the first week of spring training. So what do we do about it? Live with it? Can we teach a different way to pitch? Do you go to a six-man well, rotation? I mean, how do you try to get more out of these pitchers? Well, one of the things is, you know, you're seeing more and more uh, Tommy John injuries at an earlier age. I know the travel ball and, you know, the parents are, are, and the coaches are going to have to be more diligent. We're seeing so many, so much wear and tear on these guys. It used to be multi-sport players. You look at bios now, you don't you see a lot of them just playing baseball only. The human elbow and shoulder needs rest. I mean, one of the first things we do with pitchers is you shut them down. You don't let them pick up a baseball. It's not a year-round sport pitching. You can't do it. And there's just so many reps that guys are getting now, especially hitters. You're seeing a lot more injuries because you got more batting practice pitchers. You got more machines. You got more uh, short toss. You got more uh, all type of. These guys are constantly torquing your body, and it's just a matter of time before your body says, "Hey, I need a rest. Something's not right here." And I just think that you look at. A, like what's going to happen with the Yankees and a lot of teams when they come back to spring training, they're going to be challenged. Now you've done that. That was one of the the original reasons I wanted to have you on because you'd be the perfect guy to talk about this. Don didn't want me on that. He didn't didn't think it was genius, Buck. I thought it was genius. He he thought it was just attaboy. No, no, wait a minute. Okay. Buck, you are a brilliant guest, (laughs) but I don't think Michael is brilliant for suggesting you. Is that fair? (laughs) You know, I, I think you are a brilliant guest. I give, I give Michael an attaboy for getting you. <laughs> hey, Mike, you know, Mike, if you're constantly going to need to be patted on the back about every decision you that's make right. in the wrong business. <laughs> that, well, that's how I am. I need that. I need the constant we all affirmation. Do, we all do. All right, so in 95, you had a team. Uh, there was a work stoppage. You had a three-week or clo- longer than that with the uh, replacement players. Then the strike is settled when you're in Colorado with the replacement players, and you have to go back, and it's only three weeks. How difficult was that, Buck? What is the minimum, if baseball does return this year, that they could get their team and their pitchers ready? Mike, you know, you know I'm not going to bore everybody with some of the details, but we had gone up there. I think we might have played the first game in Coors Seal. And about yep. the seventh inning, we found out the strike had been settled. And we as coaches, it was probably the low point of all our careers, and we – knew that we were headed back to Fort Lauderdale that night. And we couldn't wait to get the game over. And we were so happy when the ball went through our second baseman's legs and the game ended in the bottom of the night because we were taking off our jerseys going up the runway. 
And now we had to turn our attention to getting another team ready. And the biggest challenge you're going to have there is the pitching. The position players and that stuff will come quickly. Spring training is probably a little long for them. But the problem is you don't have a uh, a buffer zone or you don't have a safety net if someone gets hurt now. I'm talking about position players, too. You know, because now you're talking about being set back. I don't know if we're going to end up with bigger rosters or whatever, but the biggest challenge that Aaron and his staff will face is going to be getting the pitching ready and not getting too fast because – and you're not going to see guys, or you, I don't think you should personally, seeing guys pitching seven, eight innings the first time out. You're going to probably have to have the guys that have some depth in their bullpen. I would assume that they're going to add some pitchers to this to stay away from some of the injuries. But uh, the biggest challenge you're going to face is getting the pitching ready and the lure to go too fast. You can't go too fast. I think we went a long time before we let anybody go more than five or six innings. And the starting pitchers are going to be have to be held back a little bit and not try to – the finish line is not the start of the season anymore. So now, l- let me let me piggyback on that though. So the pitchers were almost ready, Buck. They were two weeks away from you know opening day. So let's say I mean we're all lucky and the world recovers quickly, and they decide they're going to start the season in June. Have the pitchers gone all the way back to zero? Mike, not completely, because mentally they're not back to zero. Emotionally they're not back to zero, which means something. Okay, it does. Physically, you can't assume anything when you go to camp with these guys. You know, you can't assume that somebody, as much as you try to, to uh, stay in contact and what have you, you know, I, I talked to Aaron a day or two ago about just baseball, and uh, that's going to be the challenge for them. As, as much as you try to stay in touch with these guys, uh, you can't assume anything when you go there. So you're going to have to kind of treat everybody the same. I mean, can you imagine if you go too fast with a, with a cold, especially with some of the injuries the Yankees have now, their depth is really going to be tested. It's one of their strengths, but it's also going to be uh, tested. And you can't afford to go too fast. You can. And I, I think you've got to start out treating it like you're back at square one. Now, the challenge baseball has, Buck, is, is the winter. So they can't go too deep into November here. So if we don't get back until till July or deeper into the summer, is there to you a number, a minimum that, that you can play to say that it's a season that's worth doing? Well, I think once again, you know, there's so much unknown about when it's going to start. But to me, a minimum is half the season. You know, I think uh, if you look at the number, as as long as we're playing the same number of games, the sense of urgency is going to be, I think, entertaining. You know, it's not that go through a bad stretch, short stretch. There's going to be a sense of urgency with every game played when the when the season's shortened. And I think you're asking for some real problems if you're playing a World Series in the middle of November. You know, I, I spoke with, with David Cohn today, and we're talking with Buck Showalter on the Michael K. Show, and, you know, Mariano Rivera was on with us. He said, it can't be a 60-game season. That doesn't crown a true champion. And I, I felt like 100, even 80 was probably the bottom line. But David yeah. brought up a good point. I want to throw it at you. Uh, David mm-hmm. said, if it's 40 or 50, you have to do it for the good of the country. People need it. You make it, you make right. it work at 40 or 50. Do you agree? Yeah, I think, by the way, I think David's one of the most brilliant guys out there when it comes to baseball and pitching. He's one of those pitchers that understands all parts of the game. And, yeah, I think it's secondary. I mean, how many games you play, as long as you're playing the same number of the games, I think the game's going to be celebrated. All all sports are going to be celebrated when we get back. So um, I think he's exactly right that in terms of your priorities, I mean, whether you play 40, 50, 80, 100 games, who cares? As long as we're playing the same number of games and we're presenting a, a healthy um, environment for our fans to be in, I think that's what's paramount. See, that's an interesting question too, Buck, because I do think we miss sports and we will oh. flock back. But will we go to games as much? Because, uh, first of all, you can have the economy. Will people have the money to go? And also, will there be a certain period of, I'm not sure I want to sit next to somebody I don't know. I'm not sure I want to be someplace where, where there are 50,000 people. Do you think there'll be yeah. an adjustment period? Well, you know, I've, one, of the, one of the complaints I have had, just in, in tongue-in-cheek, is we've made it so easy to stay home and watch games. You know, uh, believe me, nobody puts on a game better than the Yes Network. And, and you know, okay, am I going to go park? Am I going to do this? Am I, oh, am I just going to? tape it and watch it when I can down in the um, man or woman cave down below and, and watch it when I want to and cut out the commercials if I want to. 
so now it's the flip side of that. I think it's it's you're still going to have a great fanship to it, but I think people are going to pick their spots. And, and there's a lot of unknown there. And anybody can sit here in Callis and say this is exactly what's going to happen is kidding themselves. Now, um, when baseball does come back, Buck, there's a chance that social distancing will still be in uh, something that the, the, the scientists say what, is what we need to do. So they might be playing games in front of empty stadiums. And you were a man who managed the Orioles during the riots when they played that game in an empty stadium. What is the challenge there? What was that like? Well, we certainly won't have to worry about any trash cans being banged because you'll be able to hear it for sure. Yes, for sure. Um, I said that. I don't know if I should have said it, but I said it. But I, <laughs> hey, uh, it's I been proven. That, you know, can I tell you, though, I, you didn't want to say it at the time. There was a lot of things. After the first inning or two of that game, you know, it really hit me what drove a lot of the, the, the speed of the games and how, how long they were taking. I think that game was like two, 205, 210. You know, there was no walk-up music. There was, you know, there's so much emotion of the players that is driven by the reactions of the fans. Some guy throws a curveball three inches from somebody's shoulder and everybody's going, ooh, ah, he's throwing at him. But, you know, you didn't have any of that. People, the umpires could hear every word you said. I could hear Jim Palmer uh announcing the game upstairs. I mean, there was a certain purity of the game that you were, you know, you thought you were in instructional league or extended spring, but once the first inning or two got by, people played the game. They got in the box, they hit, they threw the baseball. There was a certain pureness of the game. I didn't have to pick up the phone to call the bullpen. I could just yell down there, get Dick Britton up, you know? So it was, uh, it was interesting. Not something I want to do all the time, but, um, it really made me kind of step back and go, you know, you want to talk about pace of game. You know, I think we've identified it, it, and the enemy is us. Did the players have a hard time playing with the same intensity without the fans, without the music, the walk-up music, things like that? No, Mike, they didn't. That's what kind of not shocked me, but I went, wow. There was a certain professional, and I don't know if you did it for 20 days, what would change, but right. uh, because, you know, the fans drive so much of, the, the player, you know, you need it sometimes. You come off a late night game on the West Coast, and next day you may be playing a day game somewhere. You need that, something that reminds you that it's important to a lot of people. I used to tell our guys, hey, we're on the West Coast, it's 11th in in Seattle. Somebody in Baltimore is living and dying with every pitch you're throwing and you're, you're swinging at. So, you know, that I, I think it would be short lived if you went through it with not many people in the stands. I think some of that would start to drag down the uh, intensity level. Do you think a lot of the vitriol fans would have against the Astros, would it dissipate by the time uh, we get a chance to play? i got to tell you, someone made a point the other day that uh, if there's, the Astros may have kind of gotten off the hook a little bit, some with this. Um, that being said, uh, I think you're still going to see that not go away. Fans, especially baseball fans, have a long memory. They, they, dealt, you know, they dwell on history as much as anybody and especially in New York, they have such a great memory of things that went on. I don't think you're going to see it completely go away, but I think you are going to have it kind of dulled a little bit. Baseball is a big uh, handshake, high five sort of sport. Do you think that that's going to change forever now? Not forever, Mike. You know, you know, we, I, I don't think the – who knows? You know, we're all talking about something that's uncharted territory. Anybody can sit here and smugly say this is what's going to happen, this is going to happen for sure. I just don't see it. I think we're going to kind of wade our way through it as we go. And if some of us, I hate to say it's going to be trial and error, but there's going to be some unknowns and some very qualified people are going to give us some uh, guidelines to go by. Think about no, how neg- think about how dangerous this could be for the future of grab ass. I mean, it could never be the same, Buck. Well, some of that's good because you know, I'm not a, ever been a big fan of grab ass to start with. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Buck, you love you. you you love sports. It's not just baseball. So what are you doing to fill your time? I know you're talking to Angela, but you've got 24 hours in a day. What are you watching? You know, Mike, i got to tell you, I've been more busy than I have been in a long time. You know, I was getting ready for the season, you know, with, with the Yankees and everything and MLB TV some. But, uh, like, right now we get off here and we're, we're planting tomatoes. I ain't taking no chances. Uh, you know, we got the grandchildren around the corner. And, you know, it's been uh, – Believe me, you tell me something on uh, TV, Netflix, or anything like that. Unfortunately, I guess they played the 95 playoff series against Seattle. I've been getting a lot of calls about that, questioning things. 
you know, I, I hope they go on to another series. But, but people act like that's pleasant for me to remember. Was that the worst, uh, the worst experience in your career? That no, game because uh, it was so painful. Replacement players was the worst experience. Mr. Steinberg said, "Stick, don't worry about it. We're going. It's going to be settled before. Don't worry about putting a good team together." Then, about five days before, it looked like we were going to play with them. He said, "You guys are." You know, you guys need to work. We sent scouts down to Mexico. We started signing players left and right because you're going to be look like be held accountable. So that was awful. So, but the uh, the thing I wish I, I hope and pray that nobody ever has to go through a flight from Seattle back to New York. I think that's the if I ever write a book, that's that's the untold story that I think fans getting on a plane and having the conversation with Mattingly that he was going to retire on the plane and. Just so many things on that trip back that made me realize, you know, one, how lucky you are to be in that situation, but also how heartbreaking and how sudden uh, victory and defeat go hand in hand. Is there anything you would want to do differently in that series? Of course. I don't know how everything is going to turn out in my life. Yeah, but that's part of life. You know, you, you, we we're always learning along the way, but I actually – when I hear people say that that's kind of rekindled their love for the game after the strike that series, and I take a lot of pride in that. Because if you look back at that team that Seattle had put together in Lou, I mean, that was just, they were so good. And, you know, we were a peace team that really uh, Gene Michael had put together, just people that, that fit. And uh, it was too bad somebody had to lose. Of course, Randy Johnson, what did he do, pitch every game? Yeah, he pitched with no day's rest. Well, you did, he did that in Arizona, too. Well, if I'd known how good Mariano was going to be, of course, we used him a lot. And I remember that we took some grief for even putting him on the postseason roster, and he, he played a big role in that playoff. I, I, I read a story yesterday, and I, I wanted to ask you about this because I had never heard it before, and you were in the Yankee organization at the time. It was in the Athletic, and it was, it was a, they said it was a done deal. In 89, the Yankees, George Steinbrenner and the owners of the Giants, agreed to trade Will Clark for Don Mattingly, and the Yankees were going to get Atlee Hamaker and another pitcher as well. Uh, and I think the Yankees were sending Rick Roden. Did you ever hear of that deal? I heard some rumblings of it. You know, it wasn't the type, you know, I was so blocked in that, you know, Gene not, Stick always told me things he thought I needed to know. And if he right. didn't think that it fit in managing that team, he was, if they got down to the end game, and we were getting ready to do it. So hey, we can, he, he would say, "Hey, we can do this." What do you think? And we didn't get to that point. But that's not to say it wasn't uh, close. Yeah, it, the, the deal is written here: Rick Roden and Mattingly for Will Clark, Atley Hamaker, and Craig Lefferts. And you know, as much you know how I feel about Mattingly, I know how you feel about Mattingly. But that would not have been a bad deal because Mattingly had one more good year, and then his back broke down, and, and Will Clark actually had pretty good years. But, what, I mean, so many things would have changed. In the story, they said that if they had had Mattingly, they had to sign him, and there's no way they would have signed Barry Bonds, and then the Yankees would have gotten Barry Bonds. Well, yep, and that would have been another story altogether, too. But, yeah. you know, Mike, to, to this day, I still think about one of the best trades ever made there was the one that Donnie allowed us to make because we knew that he wasn't coming back and nobody else knew that Stick was able to trade for Tino Martinez. Um, Jeff Nelson, that, that trade – for I believe it was Russ Davis and Sterling Hitchcock, there was somebody else that came back, but that 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 really set up the Yankees to have a first base because as soon as they knew he wasn't coming back, the price would have gone way up. I think it was Jeff Nelson, the other guy, which has made an amazing deal. I think I mentioned that, but Jeff Nelson, there was another guy in that deal, I believe. Uh, but, Jim uh, Messier. Jim Messier, who you know pitched well. Yeah. Great change up. Wow. Don, I'll take it all something? back. I was going to say, I take it all back. Sheer brilliance by my. I told you. I yeah, told you it was. You really did take deliver. It I, I, yeah, you got you, you want to apologize, Don? No, I just, I, 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 I'm not going to apologize. I'm not going to I'll admit I was wrong. I'm not going to okay. apologize. Nobody got, right. Nobody's feelings got hurt. Bucks I don't and know. Manny Buck, Buck seemed hurt. I don't know. No. I think Buck's feelings were hurt. No, no, my feelings are, well, are been numb for a long time. <laughs> He's dead inside. <laughs> you, you see the rule that they put in an A ball and rookie ball about you can't throw over the first without stepping off? What are you thinking about that? There's going to be a lot. Ricky Henderson's record's going to be broken. Well, you know, if someone asked me about it, and I said, well, you know, I was on the competition committee at one time, but first of all, managers aren't going to let guys steal second third. So you're going to have slower games. They're going to step off, hold the ball, step off, hold the ball. Pitchers are now going to be asked to go 1-1, one, 1-2 one, one, the plate, so the velocities and the spin rates are going to go down. 
you're going to have uh, just constant. To, I don't. Know, how about Andy Pettit and uh, guys with great moves are no longer going to be effective. You're not going to make moves to bring in a guy who can hold a runner on. So left-handers with a great move no longer an asset. And scouts, so I'm a scout. I'm not looking for a catcher who can throw anymore. I'm looking for a guy who can catch and hit because throwing doesn't matter anymore for catchers. Amazing stuff. Very quickly, in a, in a minute, what did you do? Did you understand Tom Brady leaving the Patriots? Because we talked to a lot of people, and they said it it became so much about winning and never celebrating that it became too much for him, even though he won the six Super Bowls. Could you understand what he's saying? Could you understand the way Belichick is? Mike, you know, I think there's a lot more. We can't sit here and say we know everything going on there. And the one thing that I remember that Gene Michael always stressed, and John Hart did the same thing, is you never – let a star fall on you. You'd rather be a year early than a year late because there's nothing worse for an organization. The respect you have for a, 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 a player like Tom Brady, I'm not saying that he's not going to win a Super Bowl this year, but you would rather be a year early than a year late because of the situation it puts your organization in when you have this guy that you want to show respect for and you want to remember all the great things he's done for you. But at some point, all of us can no longer do the things we could do at one point. So I think it was almost something that's good for both of them. He's going to get another pop with, with something that's going to kind of rejuvenate him, you know, whatever he may have left. And the Patriots can – they may have a down year, but they're going to be back because nobody drafts better than them. They, they, they understand what type of player they're looking for to play in their system, and they go find them. Buck, great stuff. Stay safe. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you for coming on. Thanks, Buck. Mike, God bless you. Appreciate the time. Y'all take care. You got it. That's Buck Showalter. When we return...